Okay. Welcome everyone to our second lecture. It's part of the Orthodox Music Masterclass 2021. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Father Ivan Moody. I will take a few minutes to list his accolades, not in a formal way, but to acknowledge and appreciate everything that he has accomplished as an example to us in our own uh, paths and journeys. Father Ivan studied music and theology at the universities of London, Jensu, and York, where he took his doctorate. He studied composition with Brian Dennis, Sir John Taverner, and William Brooks. His music has been performed and broadcast all over the world, commissioned by world-renowned artists. I'll proceed now to list some accomplishments in three areas of endeavor, mainly as a composer, as a conductor, and as a musicologist. His largest works to date are Passion and Resurrection, the Akafistos Hymn, other significant works of recent years include the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, number two, Greek liturgy commissioned by the Society of St. Romanos. The Land That Was Not, commissioned for the BBC singers and cellist Nicholas Alstedt, and premiered in London in October 2014. In 2016, he completed Los Espejos de Valexquez for the pianist Artur Pizarro, Paris 7 a.m. for soprano Susie LeBlanc and Petrarch Cycle, Le Vergine for Stimwerk, Lacrime for the Brass Ensemble Septura, and the Large Scale Vesper Sequence for New York Polyphony, premiered to great acclaim in New York in January of 2017. I was present at that performance and it was indeed stunning. In 2017, he completed Psalm Antiphon for the Lisbon University Chamber Choir, a companion work to Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms. As a conductor, Ivan Moody has directed and collaborated with many choirs and vocal groups, notably Voces Angelique and the Kastalsky Chamber Choir in Britain, both of which he founded, and Capilla Peña, Florida in Spain. In 1992, he was invited by Radio Nacional de España to direct the inaugural concert in celebration of Columbus Day, broadcast live to more than 30 countries. <clears throat> he is a founder member of Ensemble Alpha, specializing in Eastern and Western medieval music, at and which has given hugely successful concerts in various European countries and the USA and the Pravoslava Chamber Choir. He is in frequent demand as a guest conductor and has given courses with a number of groups, such as Capilla Peña, Florida, Spain, Vertice, and the Choir of the Semanas Internacional de Musica Portugal, the early, mus the early music ensemble of the UFF, Brazil, Capella Romana here in the US, the Winter Tour Vocal Ensemble Switzerland, the Orthodox Choir of the University of Jensu in Finland, the Choir of St. George's Cathedral, Novi Sad, Serbia, and on and on. Um, I will stop there in terms of the conducting engagements and move on to Father Ivan's activity and accomplishments in the realm of musicology. As a musicologist, Ivan Moody has published extensively on the music of the Balkans, Russia, and the Mediterranean, with a particular emphasis on contemporary music and sacred music. His book, Modernism and Orthodox Spirituality in Contemporary Music, was published in 2014. He is a researcher at CESEM, Universidade Nova Lisbon, having previously been professor of church music at the University of Eastern Finland and is founder and president of the International Society for, the Orth for Orthodox Church Music, founder member of the music panel of the European Academy of Religion, and coordinator of the music panel of the International Orthodox Theological Association. He is a proto-presbyter of the Orthodox Church under the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople and rector of the parish of St. John the Russian in Estoril, Portugal. It's my greatest pleasure, and with gratitude, I introduce Father Ivan Moody. Let's give him a warm, warm welcome. 
Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Thank you, Peter, for that terrific introduction, um, which blows up many balloons that probably are um, seem much bigger than they were. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about orthodox aesthetics and contemporary art. Uh, and I'm going to give a, begin with a kind of formal lecture, but I don't want to go on too long because I really do want to have some discussion. So I'll read this paper and I may stop myself if I find that I'm going over time in order that we can have time uh, to talk uh, about the, the subjects arising. And there's also a sound file, or a video in fact, which I hope to be able to play at the end of this. So. Without attempting to arrive at anything resembling a definitive statement, I should like to touch today on some aspects of orthodoxy and contemporary art, in particular music. It's a theme that I believe deserves more sustained and profound consideration than it has in general been accorded. Though much recent popular reaction might lead us at times to believe that the depths of spirituality are immediately apprehensible through certain works of art, Reactions from within the Orthodox Church itself and proper consideration of the position of the artist who takes spiritual matters seriously must inevitably lead us to a realization that the situation is in fact far more complex than this would suggest. The late Orthodox theologian Philip Sherrod wrote that, quote, the bitter truth is that both the artists and the works of art that have formed the culture of our local European and American world are for the most part amongst the chief agents of precisely that fragmentation and alienation, the full effects of which are now all too evident. There can be no art that can resist, let alone prevent, the triumphal course of our technological civilization towards whatever nemesis it may be leading us, except that which itself derives from a way of life whose vision and central experience transcend these categories, psychic, materialistic, of which this civilization is the final monstrous projection. And there can be no art that manifests such vision and experience, no art that possesses a sacred quality, until there are artists who have first rediscovered how to live a way of life in which their realization is possible." End of quotation. Now, even if one adopts a slightly less apocalyptic view of art, uh, of, of our current times than Sherrod was wont to do, his argument requires serious analysis. He took the view that the modern world is so skewed, so eccentric, in the true sense of that word, in other words, decentered, that one had to pose the question of whether it was even possible to create a work of sacred art. Could the artist penetrate his surroundings in order to re-establish contact with spiritual realities in such a way that he would become equipped to become a vehicle for such creation? Is it possible, while accepting Sherrod's central thesis that we live in a culture in ruins, to argue that a more optimistic vision is required in order for creation to be possible? If, in other words, one searches for glimpses of the sacred and the secular, if one searches for links with the truth of Christianity in the humanism of the Renaissance, if one is receptive to the idea of Messiaen's music or Hoare's paintings, say, opening a door to the sacred rather than viewing them as monstrous expressions of Western decadence and complexity, one acquires some sort of context in which to situate the search for the expression of the sacred as it is understood in orthodoxy. Indeed, recent musicological and iconographical research has revealed to the re that to view East and West as two opposing forces is precisely a product of our modern fragmented way of thinking. The Bulgarian musicologist, musicologist Svetlana Kuyumjeva, amongst others, has worked on post-Byzantine chant and the relationship of sacred chant to Bulgarian folk music. She's taken a synthetic approach, examining a number of chant traditions and taking the view that there was an open culture between East and West during the Middle Ages, something confirmed not only by the work of such scholars as Jorgen Rasted, but for example, by recent musicological investigation and performances of Croatian medieval music by Katarina Livljanic, and also recent research by Croatian and Italian scholars into iconography in the Adriatic. <clears throat> For an orthodox artist working in a Western milieu, such an approach is not only likely to be more positive and more fruitful, but also better able to transmit 
the theological richness and truth of the Orthodox faith to that very milieu. In saying this, however, I wish to make it very clear that I'm not advocating any kind of theological or doctrinal compromise, still less any kind of facile universalism or perennialism. On the contrary, it seems obvious that by proclaiming Christian orthodoxy in the arts, the creators of those same arts have a God-given opportunity to witness to their beliefs. It is important too, at this point, to draw a, a distinction between liturgical art and paraliturgical art, and I will come back to this term, keenly aware of what uh, Dr. Kurt Sander said uh, yesterday. Um, paraliturgical art and what one might characterize as spiritual art in inverted commas. The problem of reconciling the still prevalent or even dominant notion of the artist's drive to self-expression with the ideal of the egoless iconographer, a theme very common in much orthodox discussion of these matters, has, I would argue, been posited in too simplistic a fashion in discussion of this theme. In the late 1980s, uh, the late Sir John Taverner spoke about this a good deal in a number of lectures and writings. In an interview he gave to Paul Griffiths in 1985, he said, quote, if one sees music as a spiritual journey, as I do, then it must always go forward, and I think it must eventually end in silence. I never understood that with Stockhausen, why it didn't end in silence. Perhaps it will. I think it must end in silence and go on to prayer, which is a higher form of creativity. Now, the problem with viewing the question in these terms is that it confuses what is, what is essentially a monastic vision of creativity with the position of an artist living in the world. And whether prayer is a form of creativity in precisely the way Taverner means here must be seriously questioned, bringing into play as it does the use of the imagination in prayer. As St. Maximus the Confessor wrote, the virtues separate the intellect from the passions, spiritual contemplation separates it from passion-free conceptual images of things. Pure prayer brings it into the presence of God himself. By the above observations, I do not mean that it is not possible for an artist to live monastically in the world, because it obviously is possible. That's possible for an artist as it is for any other person. But that there is a confusion of aims here. If a composer wishes to write liturgical music within a particular tradition, then he or she needs to sub subject him or herself to that tradition. This is precisely what Taverner never did though he spoke constantly about tradition at this period and used elements of tradition in his work. I do not believe that an artist, an artist of his creative strength, brought up as he was in the traditions of Western classical music, could possibly dissociate himself from his ego sufficiently to do this, and neither do I believe that it would be desirable. Magnificent achievement, there are works such as his vigil service, written for an Anglican choir of Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford, and celebrated by Orthodox clergy, is, and much though it does indeed draw from Greek and Russian tradition, it is also utterly impregnated with Taverner's personality, from the melodic style to the lush harmonies and the use of handbells, which, by the way, were authorized by Metropolitan Callistos. Naturally, all this is problematic only if one believes that one is working within a particular tradition. In accepting that it is a mixture of traditions and liturgically eccentric in part for that reason, as Taverner himself subsequently did, the problem ceases to exist. If one changes the perspective and views such a work as the proclamation of orthodox belief designed for particular circumstances in a non-orthodox country, it becomes instead a fascinating monument to the richness, riches of several musical traditions and a unique liturgical achievement. By extension, it's possible for works that are apparently completely secular and which do not even employ voices to be shot through with Orthodox Christian metaphysics. My work from 1988, Epitaphios for solo cello and string orchestra, for example, is a literal depiction of the crucifixion, the harrowing of hell and resurrection. When it was premiered in Athens, a large proportion of the audience intuitively understood it in that sense because of the manifold references to Byzantine chants from Holy Week. When it was performed on another occasion in Canada, there was no such connection, but it met with a similarly warm response. And my piano quintet, Nocturne of Light, from 2009, which was commissioned and premiered by Paul Barnes, um, deals with the same theme and also contains direct reference to Byzantine chant at his request. 
and my double bass concerto, The Morning Star from 2003, deals with the theology of the cross. A number of Arvel Pärt's works, such as Siloan's Song for String Orchestra, could also be cited in this context. In such a situation, any message that is contained in the music will inevitably reach some and not others. And this is as it should be, because the musical message is actually far greater than the framework imposed by the composer's inspiration. If one takes this path, that of accepting that one is creating in a desacralized world, that not only is one far from an Edenic state, but that one cannot even create work of sacred inspiration and claim that one speaks for the whole of Christianity, then paradoxically, the overwhelming negativ negativity of such a situation becomes the basis for a positive response. Despair, as the sin against the Holy Spirit, is impossible. One can only look up. Some composers from the Orthodox world, such as the Serbian Rajko Maksimovic and the Greek uh, Michalis Adamis, have always known this. Maksimovic, highly respected both inside and outside his native country, has never limited his musical vocabulary and expressive potential. His music, which draws deeply from sources of Serbian Orthodox inspiration, demands to be taken, taken seriously as contemporary art music, not as a specialist product on the extreme fringes. The same is true of Adamis, who perhaps embraced this putative dichotomy with even more fervor, in that he was active not only as a musicologist working on Byzantine chant, but studied electronic music in the United States. The ne plus ultra of this is perhaps his work Kratima from 1971, which takes a recording of a Greek psaltis and subjects it to electronic manipulation. While his later music entered more deeply into the melos, the melodic structure of Byzantine chant, without such an externally visi visible conflict, it is undeniable that the heritage of modernism was made use of by Adamis in an entirely natural and musically and spiritually productive way. Some comments made by Arvo Pert in an interview given to Enzo Restania a few years ago are also of considerable relevance here. Pert said, quote, as you see, once again, we come up against the concept of spirit. By the term spiritual, I do not understand anything mystical, but very concrete things. There are various ways of thinking. Some have a constantly negative vision. Others see everything in a positive light. Early music and art in general teach us to look at things in this perspective. For example, Fra Angelico painted pictures in which he portrays, portrays the last judgment. Naturally, hell is represented, but even this is though it were in some way veiled with holiness. There's only a little more color. For other painters who came afterwards, hell was a more real place, but their heaven was not as pure as that of Fra Angelico. End of quotation. It's clear that in Pert's music, with the possible exception of his Miserere, that heaven for him is as present as it is for Fra Angelico or Mozart, and its luminosity touches everything he does. And while one may certainly detect resonance of the Russian choral tradition in more recent works, such as the Canon Pokayanan, and also more recent works than that, it is significant that Pert's musical sources at the time, when he was attempting to renew his style, were not Eastern but Western. Gregorian chant, Mashu, Ochakim, and Palestrina. Titus Burkhardt, the Swiss scholar of comparative religion, touched on this matter in his extraordinary treatise Principe et Méthode de la Sacrée, first published in 1958, in which he wrote, quote, the Christian world has always known, side by side with an art that is sacred in the strict sense of the world, a religious art using more or less worldly forms, unquote. Though Burkhardt was concerned particularly with the plastic arts, this statement seems to me to be particularly relevant to the present discussion. A great many works by Adamis, Tavana, Parth, and myself fit particularly well in this category. As examples, one could cite Adamis's Teteleste, Tavana's The Protecting Veil, Parth's Dopo la Vittoria, or my piano concerto Linno Lalu. The late Lima de Freitas, a Portuguese painter, once said that Quote, art is not art if it's not sacred, unquote. While his definition of sacred was in any case rather different from mine, I would subscribe to a modified version of this proposition while emphasizing that sacredness may well not be evident to all who come into contact with the art. Art is not art if it has no love. If with St. Paul we believe that God is love, the consequences that follow from such a statement are self-evident. 
With the above in mind then, I would like to close with some considerations on the idea of paraliturgical uh, composition. It might be thought that as both composer and priest, my entire musical attention would be focused on the liturgy. In a sense it is, but that does not mean an exclusive dedication to functional liturgical music. And again, this relates to the various discussions we've had in the, in the seminars over the past couple of days. Um, I've always resisted what I think of as the Kappelmeister syndrome, whereby a composer defines himself exclusively as a church composer and very frequently writes music of substandard quality. It's my firmly held belief that composers need to learn to be composers with no qualification of the role and acquire all the skills that will make them able to respond for requests for music of very different kinds, even if they may subsequently spend most of their time actually writing for liturgical contexts. What can be said then of the question of writing new paraliturgical music? Extant repertoires of such music, diverse though they are, certainly do not exhaust the possibilities of the genre if such it can be called, and indeed one could conceivably argue that the genre is in infinitely expandable. There's also the missionary argument, the idea that what, what is often called in the United States soft evangelism may take place when the liturgy as it were is taken to the marketplace, somewhat like St Paul preaching in the Agora in Athens. And it is an idea that may have its attractions, though personally I have never sought to proselytize in this way. Nevertheless, as the existence of traditional repertoires of paraliturgical music indicates, both Eastern and Western, there is a space for something between the church and the community in which a need for something that brings the sacred into the world is fulfilled. Wedding songs, carols for various liturgical seasons and so on. In modern Western society, I would argue that the space has been expanded in such a way as to include the concert hall. While thinking about this subject, I came across a definition of the word paraliturgical, which seems to me quite remarkable. It's to be found at the uh, catholicculture.org website, in turn taken from the modern Catholic dictionary by Father John Harden. And it reads as follows, quote, form of public worship in which Catholics engage without following the official liturgy or take unauthorized liberties in removing or changing the words or actions required by a church law. End of quotation. Now, the first part of this definition is in accordance with what the Roman Catholic Church calls a paraliturgy, the gathering of the faithful in the absence of a priest or deacon, possibly with the distribution of Holy Communion. Of course, this would be uh, typica in the, in the Orthodox Church, a reader's service, but the distribution of Holy Communion could only take place with clergy present. The second part is more intriguing without following the official liturgy, which means that there is room for improvisation in the paraliturgy. And the third, positively alarming, take unauthorized liberties in removing or changing the words or actions required by church law. This is an extremely negative view <laughs> of paraliturgy, but it is clearly born of experience. While I'm glad to say that I've had no such experience myself, the second part's mention of an unofficial liturgy of course suggests such things as the medieval pilgrim songs from the Libre Belmel or the collections of Laude Spirituale used by the Brotherhoods in Italy in the Middle Ages and long after, and these examples seem to me fruitful models and much closer to what I have in mind when I use the word paraliturgical. In the absence of an actual lay service or of a brotherhood requiring processional hymns, however, it seems to me that the main motivation for the composition of a new paraliturgical work today must be the discovery of a text. And one point of departure is the existence of spiritual or dogmatic texts that lie outside the ritual framework for various reasons. These could naturally include texts that have already been set to music, such as carols or the Laude Spirituale. And there's the fam famous example in the Orthodox world of the paraliturgical hymn Agni Parthene, whose text was written by St. Nectarius of Egina. But there are other kinds of spiritual poetry of much greater dimensions. The Contakia of the sixth century St. Romanos, the melodist, provide a good example, a very appropriate saint for this particular gathering. Uh, in that the Contakion, in its original, very lengthy liturgical form as a poetical sermon, no longer has a place in the Byzantine liturgy. We therefore have a corpus of extended texts of great theological depth and poetic skill, which also possess a very clear structure that were written for liturgical use, but now have no function. They would seem an obvious source for composers seeking for uh, spiritual texts, 
but have in fact attracted little attention. The only examples of which I know are by a, a Lutheran composer, Paul Nicholson, which sets the Kontakion on the victory of the cross in the translation by Archimandrite Ephraim Lash of Blessed Memory, and the setting by the late Richard Tunsing, who was Orthodox, of the Kontakion on the Nativity of Christ. Other suitable texts, though they've never had a liturgical function precisely, are theological poems, such as the Hymn to the Holy Spirit by St. Simeon the New Theologian, which begins with a series of invocations that easily suggest musical treatment. Come true light, come life eternal, come hidden mystery, come treasure without name, etc., etc. And this text was indeed set by the late Sir John Taverner as the central movement of his icon of light. Um, and I adopted a similar approach in a work from 2012 entitled Simenon. Simenon means today in Byzantine liturgical Greek. And the work was commissioned by the Huyvart trio from Belgium as a counterbalance to Arvo Pärt's vision of the crucifixion in his Stabat Mater, a work I admire enormously, and which prompted me to choose the theme of the resurrection. It also dictated the scoring, vocal trio and string trio. A number of hymns from Holy Week in the Byzantine Rite begin with the word today, Dnies, Simeon, underlining the reality and presence of the events of the Passion in the lives of the faithful, which is why I chose this word as the work's title. The texts I use are from the services of Holy Week and Pascha, but the center of the piece is part of a remarkable second century poetic homily, Peri Pascha, on Pascha, by Bishop Melito of Sardis. It's an extraordinary summary of Byzantine Orthodox Christian theology, placing the narrative of the Passion and Resurrection within the context of salvation history as a whole. It has been described as a precursor of the Kontakion and closely follows the liturgical sequence of Holy Friday. And its impact is quite as immediate as St. Simeon's prayer to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read it because it's, it's very short. And the law became word and the old new coming out of Zion and Jerusalem and the command grace and the image reality and the lamb a son and the sheep a man because born as a son and led as a lamb and slain as a sheep and buried as a man rose from the dead as god being by nature god and man he is everything because the, the law because he judges the word because he teaches the grace because he saves the father because he begets the son because he is begotten the sheep because he suffers a man because he is buried God, because he rises, this is Jesus Christ, whose glory is unto the ages of ages. Amen. The word today is repeatedly used in the work both as a structural pillar, as a reiteration of the presence and reality of the events of the Passion and Resurrection of Christ. While the narrative is given to the three voices, the string trio is also an active participant in its musical presentation, as well as, particularly towards the end of the work, a musical metaphysical commentator haloing the sung words as though in an icon. Such paraliturgical music, and we can discuss this term afterwards, is then for me a way forward, the creation of something that is not liturgical, but which may involve liturgical elements and is a deep expression of the church's theology, but destined performance outside the church. One could describe this in fact as an eschatological procedure. If the divine liturgy, the Eucharist, is the presence of the kingdom of God, then as artists we are certainly called upon to transmit the message of that kingdom outside the four walls of the church building. Thank you. I'm going to try and just play you a tiny fragment of, 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 of that piece, if I can find it. Um, I have to open the the um, file first. Um, please tell me if you can hear this. <clears throat> Well, there you have uh, a group of uh, Belgians and Hungarians singing a piece in Greek by an Anglo-Portuguese composer. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I would love there to be some discussion about these, uh, these themes. Thank you very much.
Father Ivan, um, though the definition of paraliturgical music is somewhat clear, I would like to ask you to elaborate, if possible, on directions that Orthodox composers can take to reconcile the paraliturgical framework, if you will, in a broad sense, with functional music that they're involved with for the church. I see this almost as a kind of bipolar um, existence, and it, it's of interest to me how, how a reconciliation can occur in a meaningful way between these two elements. Thank you for that question, Peter. Um, uh, I am very interested precisely in eliminating a bipolar experience. I, I think um, as composers, we have to be ready to do one thing or the other, or both. Um, and we're not going to have the same opportunities always to, to do both things. So um, I, I remember uh, I was asked once to, to, to um, some, somebody asked on a, on a, on a discussion group, uh, do you have a setting of the Trisagion in Spanish for children's voices? And I said, no, but I could write one. And I did, and it was performed. And then the person who asked me for this piece said, why did you write it? And I said, because you asked me to, because I speak Spanish and, and because it's something I thought was a really good thing to do, to write a, a Trisagion for children to sing in Spanish because it's something they needed. So, so that's a very practical thing one can do. Um, uh, uh, but um, speaking also as a professional composer, um, uh, uh, one has to be ready to accept challenges that will not arise in the church. And uh, you're, you're right that it can be bipolar, but there, there must be a way of balancing these things um, and, and this is why I say that I dislike the Kappelmeister syndrome. We have to be ready as composers um, to respond to anything. Um, this was one of Benjamin Britten's great things, you know. I, okay, somebody asked me for something, uh, I'll, 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 I'll do it. Um, if, if it's for kids, I'll write for kids. If it's for a symphony orchestra, I'll write for a symphony orchestra. And I, I do think that this is a, a skill that composers need to develop. And of course it transcends uh, the, 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 the question of, of, of uh, liturgical music. This is, this, is, this is something that's transversal to all composers. And this is also why I believe that composers of liturgical music must learn to be composers and have the full toolkit at their disposal so that we're able to respond in these different ways to different kinds of requests. And I don't see that there needs to be a conflict between um, uh, liturgical composition and paraliturgical or secular composition. For me, this is one continuous flow, and I, I've never seen any contradiction between these things. Mm -hmm. And I, I really would encourage composers to think like that. Well, what what comes to mind? Thank you for clarifying that. What comes to mind is Dove Sono and uh, Agnus Dei from the Coronation Mass. Uh, I just can't imagine one being more sacred than the other. Uh, That's a very good case in point. Yeah. Uh, I have a question if, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Father, for a, a wonderful talk. And uh, I, I definitely understand what you're saying about I guess you're seeing the concert hall as almost an extension of the church in some ways um, mm -hmm. and maybe that's too bold a statement uh, but I recall reading an article in the New Yorker about Arvo Peart's music and how it impacted uh, patients who were in hospice dying of AIDS in a very uh, almost spiritual way 
that probably could not have happened uh, in any other way than, than paired with music. But I guess what, what I'm a little bit concerned about is when we make, and going back to your Kapellmeister reference, uh, I think of you know the greatest Kapellmeister we know, which is J.S. Bach, who gave us concert music as a product of what he did for the church, uh, not the inverse. Um, and I'm afraid if we if we make a distinction between the Kapellmeister, what the Kapellmeister does in the church, and what a composer does in the concert hall, I I, I worry that we and I I mentioned this in my talk that we make the church into something that's antiquated, uh, that doesn't share in how we view the concert hall. And, and I think we're both in like minds and we're both thinking about it in the same way, uh, but maybe coming at it from different perspectives. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a question in there, but I'm, I'm wondering how do we keep the church from becoming non, I don't want to say experimental, but non-living. Uh, we freeze it because the stuff that's living and experimental and so forth is done in the concert. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. I, I thought you might come back to me about that. Um, uh, I think we are thinking in exactly the same way. I, one of the problems, I think, is terminological. Um, uh, and I don't necessarily think that the word paraliturgical is the best word, which is why I keep insisting that there is a space between the church and the concert hall. So there's something fluid between the two. Um, but it can, it, it, it can go the other way. Um, uh, as you were talking yesterday about uh, um, uh, uh, the huge influence that Arvo has on, 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 on um, Orthodox musicians, Orthodox people in general, but um, Orthodox musicians, but, but, but his, his technique has not been taken up in orthodox composition and there's a good reason for that is because it comes from this uh position um outside the church um and it, and is very very specific um uh, but is nevertheless able to transmit uh um how am i going to put this um uh, <laughs> i was going to say spirituality but i, I hate using this word spirituality but but you, you, uh, uh, um, it's able to 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 present us with um, a profound insight into uh, questions biblical and theological and liturgical, um, using a, a vocabulary that is unique to to himself, uh, and that's a very interesting thing to have happened. Um, um, so, so I, I think we're in a fluid situation here. Um, certainly, one of the problems, as, as many people have have said over the past few days, and and as is common knowledge, is how do you get a church choir that's good enough to sing a modern piece? And if you write a new piece for a choir, um, how do you, as a composer, um, deal with those limits, those limitations, rather? Um, and, and I always follow Stravinsky's dictum that the more limitations there are, the more freedom you actually have uh, to work with. Um, I mean, the, the thing is, if you're, if you're a composer and a rich patron gives you a huge pile of blank manuscript paper, or I suppose today it would be a, a large computer, and, and $20,000 and says, write whatever you like, um, th there's nothing to work with. You're, you're stuck. Whereas if somebody says, I need a setting of the Trisagion for three kids' voices in Spanish, you know exactly what you've got to work with and your mind starts working and your spirit starts working as well. And that to me is the important point in, in all of this. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, these are big questions and, and uh, you know, I, I thank you for, for kind of looking at it from the, the opposite way. I'm just, um, I guess the circumstance we find ourselves in prevent us from even tackling this on a, a real level, because as you said, we don't have choirs that can really handle a lot of the things that we want to do. So, so perhaps we are limited to the concert hall in that regard, but um, I suppose when, when do we change that perspective and, and start to say, well, I, I'd like to do this for the church 
and change things in the church rather than starting in the concert hall? But these are big questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah, they are big questions, and I, I don't have an answer. But it's a discussion, at least, that, that has begun, and that's important. I see that James has his uh, hand raised. Yes. Uh, hi, Ivan. Thank you very much for that uh, very uh, illuminating paper. Um, I was wondering if you could had any particular views about the opportunities uh, provided in the liturgy for music that is not in its liturgical context, for instance, performing the sticker um, during the priest's communion, as very often occurs, and also uh, after the liturgy, um, the choir can sing things which are not in a liturgical context. I wondered if that corresponds, is part of your definition of paraliturgical, and also whether you think that it's okay during those moments to perhaps perform music to words which are not part of the liturgical texts of the church. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm liturgically speaking. I'm rather strict about this, and I don't. I don't like words that don't belong. Um, so I would not welcome a concert during during communion, for example, and as I would not welcome Agni Parthene, which is performed in many Greek parishes during communion. Oh, yeah. It's something I really object to. In fact. Um, fine at the end of the liturgy, maybe when people are coming up to receive the antidoro. Um, uh, but I, I and the, the communion, of course, the, the problem in the Slavic, or the, particularly in the Russian tradition with the communion hymn, is that it's become so abbreviated. Whereas there, there are long melodies in the Greek tradition, in Byzantine tradition, and in Serbian tradition as well. There are long melodies that you can use. There are actually also Russian melodies. If you look in the Sputnik Salonshika, you'll find long communion melodies, uh, but almost nobody does them. And what you have instead is, is um, um, uh, at best augmented with a refrain from the psalm, which is fine, but you know, when, uh, especially on feasts when there are long melodies that are supposed to be sung at that point, why not sing them? <laughs> um, mm. Instead of reinventing the wheel all the time. Uh, and this is, a, this is a problem I have. Um, uh, so th this is for me more more a, in that in that sense this is a pastoral question uh, because you don't want or at least I don't want um, uh, 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 words being sung in the context of a service that have no relevance to it and and that is a risk you always run you always run if there are if if there is that kind of approach. Thanks. Father Ivan? Uh, Hello. So, yeah, one of those, uh, the point about those communion uh, hymn melodies in the uh, Sputnik and, and in the uh, other square note chant books, it's always struck me that they're all the same. It's like the same melody with a few syllables uh, thrust here and there. Um, it almost seems like like that that wasn't the uh, uh, composer's uh, favorite area of creativity. You know, they're they're almost like perfunctory, and perhaps that's, that's why that's true. But it's not the case in the Serbian or the Byzantine traditions, for example. Yeah. On the on the plus side, uh, Benedict Sheehan's latest uh, Divine Liturgy has those uh, uh, communion those 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 long communion hymn melodies. So. Uh, another reason to check out that publication. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Ivan, I, I have a question. Uh, Please, so, uh, Maestro Kartsander brought up the word experimental, and I may be uh, blowing out of proportion what he means by experimental, but then again, you mentioned Stockhausen, so I feel it's, it's a little apropos to ask this, but in a lot of contemporary art, um, many people 
you know, cringe at it or they see a painting, you know, cubist or something and they really hate it or they listen to Stockhausen and they think it's just absolutely horrid and because it's very ugly. And um, of course, there's nothing deformed about God. And so with that logic, I have heard the argument that um, the, the, the role of beauty in, in art, like, like uh, something has to be beautiful in order to be art, not even just for, for the church. Um, I mean, I, I don't necessarily uh, agree with this logic, but I just wanted to ask, like, what is the role of beauty being a subjective thing? Uh, what is the role of beauty in art? I'm glad you didn't ask me anything difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Gosh. Well, you, you said it yourself that the, our idea of beauty is subjective. But of course, if the ultimate beauty is God, um, the, our aim is to is to, <laughs> our aim is to get there in some way, and obviously, all human attempts to do that are uh, I'm not going to say they're doomed to failure because that's exactly the opposite of the Christian idea. But they are they are they're not quite ever going to get there. What we have to do is find this image in in our lives, in our, in our souls, in our spirits, and realize it in the best way we can. Um, gosh, but I mean, th then you run into things, you run into the question of taste, and taste is, is an overlooked phenomenon in the history of Orthodox church music. Um, and it's actually enough to look at the history of icons to see this, uh, you know, it, um, uh, a good example is Finland, for example, um, when they had when they when the Orthodox started to um, uh, after the the revolution in Russia, they started to uh, emigrate to Finland, and and so they needed icon painters. They didn't have icon painters; they knew nothing about Byzantium. So they got um, Lutheran people who could who could paint, and they said, "Look, look in this book. Here's a Russian icon. This is what they used to. Can you copy that?" So this is how they started. They knew nothing about Byzantine tradition. Then other people came later on and brought um, neo-Byzantine style with them. And so they began to throw out the older things. But the reality is that those older things, which were in fact inspired by decadent 19th century Western inspired Russian art, were the originals because that's what they began with. So, so one person's idea of, of, of good taste of, of, of um, spiritual beauty it can be quite contrary to another person's idea. You put a Ukrainian peasant icon next to um, uh, Rublyov or next to, to, to um, you know, a, 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 a fine Byzantine icon, and you, you see three completely different approaches to the same subject. Or, or to take a modern example, Yorgos Kordis um, uh, uh, or Aidan Hart, you know, uh, and they're all talking about the same thing they're all trying to get to the same point but the approaches the experience the influences of, of, of those people who painted those icons in their attempt to converse with god in their attempt to approach theosis they're, they're completely different so that's where the question of taste enters in and and this is a conversation that we're only just beginning to have in the orthodox church uh, about church art in in general, not just about music, but about church art in general. Irene, go ahead. Go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. I just wanted to uh, validate your point, and also, being a singer who did both liturgy, I sung your liturgy in the church, the Greek liturgy at St. Andrew Cathedral, and I did Court Sander liturgy in the church. And I was able to kind of go and, you know, besides being totally moved by those, the work myself in, 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 I know you don't like this word, spiritual way. I mean, I, I felt totally, you know, comfortable praying and singing this in church myself. And then the response from the parishioners, and we're talking about regular parishioners. One was a Greek church, kind of a high functioning, you know, 
and the other was a totally different, more like a ethnic Russian community. People were moved. I think the if if the like your father said, you know, subjective or objective. If your intent and your spirit and your heart are seeking that beauty, you know, and if it's presented the right way, thank God we had a good choir. People do respond, you know, and people were just totally moved and they prayed. So I just want to validate that point. And another thing, it's uh, there is a, a professor uh, in Moscow Conservatory. His name is Midushevsky. He wrote a lot of books about beauty and music. And he's kind of like a theologist, musicologist, you know, who is dwelling into the subject and bringing out kind of a more objective uh, a way of looking at this, you know, uh, something, you know, if, if obviously it's not a point of discussion now, but something for Timothy, if you want to look into that. I mean, he really explains that and uses examples in a, just a beautiful, very powerful way. But I just want to validate that both Father, your music and Court Sander music that we performed at the liturgy as a service moved people in that prayer. I mean, you know, and it was very objective. It was not subjective. So just want to validate. Thank you very much. Um, could I, that, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, it was lovely to have these things said. Um, could I just draw your attention to something in the chat that Bishop Damascheno Ribeiro, who's here with us, said, mm -hmm. for what it's worth, Maxim Kovalevsky actually used four invocations from St. Simeon's prayer to compose a refrain liturgically used in Pentecost liturgy in their Gallican rite, uh, which was a mixture of Byzantine and Roman elements. Um, and he says also that one might recall as well how several prayers or homilies not originally meant to be chanted were assimilated and used in, in our hymnography, such as St. Gregory's homily on Pascha, quoted and paraphrased in the Paschal Canon, as well as the Paschal verses. Quite true. And of course, we have this ongoing um, synergy between uh, liturgical texts and, um, uh, well, not paraliturgical texts, what can I say? Sermons and, and such like material. And, and certainly in the early stages of the development of the, of the Byzantine liturgy, these things were very much uh, in, in play with each other. Peter, I think you raised your hand. Yes, yeah, several times I'm, I'm uh, boiling with enthusiasm. Uh, I had the, uh, the distinct pleasure of, of directing those two liturgies that I, Irene is referencing. And I wanted to ask you about musical style as it pertains to the notion of dissonance and tonality. Uh, one comment I wanted to make about your liturgy, and uh, I hope this doesn't demean the entire composition, but one of the most moving movements uh, for me was the Isagios. Uh, I, I found that to be completely transcendent, absolutely spiritual, in a very specific way for me, and very moving to the singers. Uh, now, that piece, if you recall, is... <laughs> lovely, lovely dissonance, which is really not dissonance. It's a kind of, for me, a kind of uh, enhancement of the melody with a richness of, of texture and a richness of spiritual response. So those appearances of those clusters, they're not even, cl I don't hear them as dissonant, I hear that melody which is... <laughs> And that's the dominant element. But could you elaborate a little bit on your um, on the notion of dissonance and in developing a new direction and a style? And also, this is a, a huge uh, uh, question, but also the role of tonality. And and I must bring this up. Uh, Matthew's composition two years ago, "O Gladsome Light," 
was so so wonderfully provocative in that it challenged our imagination through this uh, kind of existing prejudice against dissonance. Um, if 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 you might. Uh, oh right. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments. First of all, Peter. Um, uh, actually, I intend to talk about this a bit tomorrow in my composition seminar, uh, using one of my pieces as an example. However, um, uh, I don't. Okay, l l let me work this through in my own way, and we'll see if I manage to answer your <laughs> your question. Um, I do not consider that I write tonal music. I consider that I write modal music. Now, um, that means that if I'm working with a, a piece of chant from whichever tradition it may be, whether it's Byzantine or Znamani or Serbian or Bulgarian or whatever it may be, um, I look at the melodic contour of that chant and I try to derive the harmony from that. And that's exactly what happens in Isagios yeah. in that liturgy. So, so you take the, the vertical grows out of the horizontal. Precisely, precisely. So that's why, and I'm glad you, 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 you put it in this way, it doesn't feel dissonant because it's organic. It's, it's a melodic, it's, a, it's like, a, like a multiple eson. It may only last for one note, but it's still a multiple eson. So it's a reinforcing of the mode or various aspects of the mode at the same time. All right. Now, um, if I'm working uh, um, not with chant, I, I still consider that I write modally, but it may be a mode of my own invention. Mm. Um, uh, in the case of the liturgy, um, which you commissioned, uh, I, I really wanted to stick to Byzantine chant and to write something. Um, now, this is a, 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 a controversial question in the United States because there have been uh, there's been this huge revolution in the way uh, liturgical celebrations have been carried out in the Greek church uh, and things have gone very much back to uh, Byzantine chant and harmonized liturgies are uh, on the way out. However, they still exist and there are some very wonderful ones. Um, there are some beautiful settings of the liturgy, polyphonic settings of the liturgy in Greek. There are also some very bad settings. Um, lots of these settings, however, make exclusive use of, of the Sakelaridis melodies, which are chopped and, and it's like a kind of Greek obichot, if you like. Greek <laughs> so the <or> melodies, <laughs> exactly. So the melodies are uh, shortened and, and squared off. Right. So I didn't want to do that. So I, I actually looked for better sources um, to which I have access. And, and which is why in fact, just as a side note, the communion hymn <laughs> that you have in the liturgy is so difficult because it's based on a piece by St. John Cucuzelis, which is a very long melody. And I understood precisely why it wasn't possible to do it at the first performance. It's not. Which didn't bother me at all that, that you know, this is liturgical reality. <laughs> um, but, but it's there if people want to and, 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 and can do it. So uh, coming back to your harmonic question, um, for me, if, if the harmony uh, materializes out of the melodic line, there's no question of it being dissonant. It can be, it can be a kind of cluster, certainly, um, but if you don't feel it as something alien, then clusters, as, as you just said, in fact, cluster's the wrong word, it's a kind of aggregate of particular aspects of the mood. You can have the mood and one note, the, 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 sorry, the, the, the base of the mode and one note below it, plus a fourth and a fifth, plus a seventh and, a, and, and the uh, sixth or, or the octave or something, you know, all, all kinds of things are possible. And um, you, you, the, the question is context. How, how, how and when during a piece do you decide to do that? Because you, you can't just, except for a special effect, and I would leave this for a non-liturgical work probably, or possibly for, for something like the acclamation of a bishop or some big festal thing, um, uh, you don't want to shock people during the liturgy. Things have to be organic. So if it's organic, it, it will work. And uh, in that context, that kind of harmony, um, I think of as being organic because it arises from the melodic chant line. Does that 
answer your question more or less? Yes, it's very helpful. Thank you, Father. Um, I have a question about going back to Timothy's question about beauty and the idea that it's subjective. Um, Father Anthony Quinieris wrote a book about do so called Do Something Beautiful for God that I found so incredibly helpful and it changed my mind that to believe that beauty isn't subjective at all. Style is subjective maybe, but um, beauty is a perfect coming together of all the components and balance and relationship, craftsmanship, design. And I think if we look at some of the great works of art in the world that transcend culture, it's because of that. And I'm wondering if, uh, if that's something, you know, we could think about or talk about with respect to, to this topic. Uh, yeah, thank you. And um, I, I perhaps expressed myself badly. Um, I did not mean to in, imply at all that there is no real beauty. <laughs> what, what I was trying to say was that we aspire to it in different ways and we miss the mark because our own conceptions of beauty are limited. We all recognize that the ultimate beauty is, is God, right? Yeah. But, but the yeah. way we are ourselves conditioned and limited um, means that our reactions to that beauty will be different. And that paradoxically is part of the richness of, 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 of our many orthodox cultures and cultures in general, I may, I may add, but, but uh, I, 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 I think I see what you mean. Um, but th that would be my response to, to that, that, that we're trying from different points with our own limitations um, to get to that ideal, uh, not ideal, but the, 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 the genuine beauty that is, that is God. That um, I sense? also would like to just mention, because I was that person that you wrote the, the Spanish Trisagi in for. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, 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 did, just, I didn't want to mention you by name in case you didn't want to be associated with it. I was just so touched that a world-renowned uh, composer would write for our little choir in our little corner of California. Sorry. Oh, it, <laughs> it was, was the uh, greatest of was, pleasures. <laughs> it was a great act of love and I appreciate that. <laughs> I guess so. so there's uh, so this uh, idea that the, the ultimate beauty is is divine then and it can be realized in in different uh, chant traditions um, is that could we think of that uh, as um, uh, the different chant traditions are like different hypostases of the of the of the of the beauty of the essence of beauty or something like that. That's a that's a very interesting way of putting it, and why not? Yes, um, and th this is this was actually my point about us being conditioned by um, our cultural surroundings and the um, the definitions of taste uh, that we grow up with. So, so that if you, if you grow up in a particular culture, you may not find something produced in another culture very beautiful at all, but um, you can still, I hope, acknowledge it as, as you say, the hypostasis <laughs> of, 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 of um, that striving towards the original beauty. I think that's a, that's a, thank you for that. That's a very good way of thinking of it. Yes, I'm thinking to the example of the, um, the emissaries of Prince Vladimir, um, they they were outside of the Greek cultural tradition. Yet they, when they went to the Hagia Sophia, they still uh, they still perceived that they were uh, they, that they, they couldn't tell whether they were in heaven on or on earth, um, or they, they 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 couldn't tell that they were on earth. They thought they were in heaven. Um, that, that, that of course is a is a more complicated question because we don't know what else they witnessed before that. I mean, they were sent around. And they may have witnessed all sorts of pagan worship. Um, I mean, we don't know. There's no context for it. Uh, um, you know, the quotation is wonderful in itself. That that passage is, is of course, a, something that inspires us. But but we we don't know what else they knew. So um, if they'd been to a 
some kind of pagan orgy with, with raucous songs the night before and then <laughs> ended up in, in Hagia Sophia on the following morning. Well, of course they would have thought they were in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, and, and, and then uh, another example, uh, I guess, I, I, well, after you've, 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 you've I, I don't know if I want to bring in another example, but uh, uh, Georgian chant, for example, is, is really distinct. But, you know, I, I, I feel when I listen to it, I feel uh, just as spiritual as, you know, listening to other chant traditions, too. So it's very ethereal. I, I think it's um, absolutely possible to feel the, the, the spiritual in, in chant traditions about which we know absolutely nothing. And that doesn't mean just Christian traditions either. Uh, the spirit blows where it will. <laughs>